Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Firefish Crowdcast. I am delighted to be joined by the lovely uh, Rhonda, and I'm going to have a stab at the second Scottish Italian mix of <laughs> D'Ambrosio. Yes, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there we go. You, you even nearly added in the Italian flourish there. <laughs> oh, no, I, think that's, <laughs> I think that's taking it a bit far, but we've had been, we've I've been getting good coaching the last five minutes. <laughs> um, and apparently, we have some surprise entries as well, potentially in the background with lovely German shepherds as well. So if you yes. hear them barking, then that's what it that's what it is. Um, yeah, I, ha so I have to apologise now, ladies and gentlemen. They've got a taste for any webinar or live crowdcast that I'm doing, but um, yeah, they won't come brilliant. in. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, thanks so much for joining us because we're going to tackle an interesting topic here. And it's one that I think is um, really um, needing lots of awareness, um, but also awareness from a recruitment leadership point of view as to how we can bring well-being and um, mental health and recruitment into a culture and actually provide one that gets us results and gets us a, gets us a return on investment. So I'm really excited because it's not often you get somebody from such a wealth of background in recruitment that then has taken this change to really focus on this niche area, which I'm, I'm really interested even just to understand why you took that change as well. So thank you for joining us, Rhonda. It's lovely um, to be here. Thank you, Wendy. Dude, and I'm going to tick kick off because I think that if we just analyse what's happened in the recruitment um, sector in the last um, you know, six months and, and why I feel that the, this topic should really get, get the airtime as well, is that you know we have had... On the one hand, lots of recruiters that have been working, you know, throughout the whole period um, and are desperate and clawing for holidays probably right now. And on the same hand, we've had to use the job retention scheme for a number of different recruiters. So they've taken some time out. They've had time to reflect. But now they're all coming back into the businesses. So there's sort of two real camps of ones that are probably you know, just needing a break and others that are probably quite concerned or worried or gosh, what's happening when they come back in. What what do you see the temperature of the market right now in terms of, um, you know, your companies that you're working with? It's, a, it's an absolutely brilliant question um, right now. And one of the things that I've talked about for the last six months is actually uh, the, the resentment between those two parties, the ones that have almost helped keep the businesses going um, versus the, the, the people that have desperately wanted to help the business going but have had to take a seat in the background. And I think that's what I've seen a huge number of business owners and directors struggle with. So it, it, it's it's. Typically, in recruitment fashion, I would say it's a bit of a roller coaster. Um, what I'm, I'm hearing is people want to get back to it. They want to get back to the office. There are some markets that haven't been as impacted. There are other markets that have been absolutely, um, you know, they're, they're almost starting from scratch again. And of course, there's there's a reassurance to um, a number of leaders to have people back in the environment that they know, the back back in the environment that they love, because it's that right. Let's just come on, get back to it focus on what we know and what we what we do best and then on the other side of the coin we've got this whole psychological safety piece of people that are still very much struggling with what's happening in the pandemic the fact that there is still a huge amount of uncertainty and you know it, this almost if you look at what we've been doing for the last 20 odd years in our industry we have we haven't really encouraged work from home or flexible working practices it has certainly improved by no short means, especially in the last decade. But we've kind of, you know, we've been able to prove that in many respects, working from home can be as effective and people can do the job. So I'm feeling quite, I see there's a, there's a number of people that are very, very torn about, you know, we just want to get back to it. We want our people to come back and to kind of feel the way we feel, but they also want to help and support their employees. And mm -hmm. it's, this is what's, I think, going to cause us some issues in the next three months if we don't address it and we don't look at this effectively. You know, how can we give people that reassurance when there's still this bubble of uncertainty and also do the right things to drive the business performance forward? Um, and, 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 and for some companies, Wendy, salvage the business that they've worked so hard for. Uh, totally. And, 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 you know, talking from, you know, an ex-agency owner as well, I, I think it's a real challenge for a lot of agency recruitment owners just now because we've probably been top billers ourselves and gone into then spinning out our company so you know I'm, I'm going to say this out, out just because it's probably where I've come from as well you know we have been brought up with come on let's just do this and get on with it yeah. you know and um, so 
we now understand this is the first recession that we've been in that's actually been health related. Mm -hmm. Now that is totally alien to anything that we've all been through before. So it's making that attitude sort of stand up and go, oh, hang on a minute. I've actually got to think about different things here, but I don't really know how to because we just get on with it. We go, we work harder. You, you've, you've kind of just hit the nail on the head there. You know, being able to say, look, this is what we are. This is in our DNA. We are, you know, one of the strongest, most resilient, adaptable industries out there. The problem, the one caveat that we have is we've never faced this sort of situation in our lifetime. You know, it's the sort of thing that, you know, our parents or grandparents may have talked about. It is, I hate using the word, you know, we should do a buzzword bingo. It is unprecedented. Um, And so therefore people don't know what the recovery rate looks like. They don't understand what the long-term implications are going to be. So we do want to kind of get back to it. But as an owner or business leader, you cannot discount the situation that people are now in. What I am hearing is because the schools have started to move back. Mm-hmm. There is a surge of positivity, a surge of, oh, thank goodness, my, my, my child's got cover, they're back at nursery, they're back at school. I can get back, I can focus, I can do stuff. But there's still that little bit of, oh, you know, we've, we've, we've been in this, um, this COVID bubble, um, so to speak, and there is, an, there is a routine that has developed in the last six months. And now we're coming out of that and we're having to... Some of us are getting back on the tubes and the trains. There is an anxiety attached to that for a lot of people. Um, you know, even the first time I went in, I couldn't help myself. I'm sat there thinking, well, you haven't got a mask on. You haven't got a mask on. Mm-hmm. You're not wearing, wearing your mask properly. And we're driven by this fear that we don't want to be back in a lockdown over, over winter. Because we've yeah. all kind of, I'm sure, enjoyed it during the summer. We've been able mm-hmm. to either do some work in the garden, get a bit of sun. We've, we've had the best time of year and one of the best summers on record. Really, I don't want to be at home in winter, locked away. I want to be out. So, yeah, definitely there is be much, much different in, in, in winter. There, there is, a, and there is a question, therefore, that needs to be asked. You know, uh, as you know, I've, I've recently, as part of mental health and recruitment, launched the survey. Yeah. And the idea behind the survey is it's um, the first one that's gone out and not only just talked to business owners and leaders, but also recruiters, op staff, and back office. And that is to get a broad view, not just because of COVID, because what we're doing is, is a, is a long term piece around mental health in the workplace. But, you know, so many organizations, just from looking at the results coming in so far, they don't they they, they're not aware that they have a legal obligation under the health and and safety executive committee to be providing things like stress risk assessments and stress management. Um, And it's things like that that you almost don't think of. Many companies that I've been working with have sort of done the physical thing and sort of said, right. So, Wendy, tell us about your workspace, how you Mm -hmm. set up. Have you got natural light? What's going on? But, you know, people don't know how to have those questions and ask those questions about risk assessment. So this is the this is where we're finding ourselves at the moment. It, and it's going to impact our company culture. So many businesses are not the same company that they were in March. It is. And I just want to hang out. I think Katie's just um, popped a wee link to that survey. You've got over like a thousand people already, which I think is awesome. And I'm sure you'll get like that. Numbers are going to fly up with it because I think, you know, this is a topic that has not been broached before in our industry and it needs to be aired and because so we can learn. Um, you know, and I think that is the only way we learn with people's comments that are coming in from that in terms of what they want, what are they worried about, how should we address it um, and get a plan together forward. Because I think yeah. that's actually where I'm talking to a lot of leaders as well. You know, they're going, right, you know, government's forcing us all to get back into London, get everything running again. But hang on a minute where's the balance because we're also then getting told well we can't be in groups of six and every, yeah. you know more than six whoa this is really quite hard for an employer as well so definitely take that survey let's feed into the results and we'll get that all back for our audience I'm sure when you've collated when you've done all the cr- the number crunching and and they got the results and I would love to distribute that for you as well thank, thank you so much and you know it, it's what we need and just to yeah. make her aware it's completely anonymous we are not looking to commercialize from the survey. This is to give us data to benchmark what we're doing and to drive this change in the industry. Because when we look at culture, when we look at things like diversity and inclusion, we don't often dig a layer down with mental health. And it's the presenteeism. If you look at the stats from the thriving at work point, you know, companies are losing billions on presenteeism. You know, people being there, seemingly doing the job, but not actually able to function and do the job because of the stress and anxiety that they're feeling. So, so um, I love that word right now because presenteeism is how we have all had to manage prior to COVID and we're all in this different 
we just jumped in we've announced at the weekend you know we are now a work from anywhere organization oh, everybody everybody is very excited I've got people moving house up north I've got people booking places over in um in, in the med with hope to go and spend a month out there um, and then tie it out to holidays so it's a really different way of working and I'm like okay yes I'm cool with this <laughs> but yes I, I've got to be so I want to look at that culture because essentially that is forcing managers not to be able to manage through hey they're turning up they're smiling they look as though they're doing a good job so let's think about all of these things and how it's going to have a positive how can we use all of this information and drive it positively into um you know that culture to get a result so you know thinking of return and investment what could we be doing in order to actually get those results in the culture and changing that so there's a few things at play there, Wendy, and I'm not sure you and I have got a few hours to talk about it to keep everyone engaged. Um, but what I would say is that we're almost there's a there's there's a I'm seeing this almost this suggestion that companies think they need to make big change. Yeah, mm -hmm. because the culture's been knocked and almost the companies had to reassess what they're doing. What their values are i'm hearing more and more companies are having to look at what what are our values what what's important to us now and i think that's the best piece of advice that i would give anybody listening look at what's changed in your business what's really been impacted is it the way in which you manage is it the way in which you reward you know where are the where are the flashpoints and the things that have really significantly changed and rather than do this huge overhaul by maybe creating this brand new um, flexibility policy um you know look at well actually what is it what where are our where are the key changes and what are the needs of our people you know are you actually talking to them and and how how has the management of our team changed and do we need to address that and impact that because we know that managing virtually is a lot harder. There is so much more we get from that physicality with people, um, with tone. And you know, I've been talking about they're, they're calling it um, Zoom fatigue, but mm -hmm. I've often I've talked about this um, in a great deal, which is this almost this remote work in acuity, whereby you can't pick up on things that you would ordinarily pick up with. So you work extra hard. When when I'm sat watching you, I'm like, right, I've got to really look at your body language because we do it naturally. And typically in recruit recruitment, that's what we're good at. We're very, we naturally yeah. we pick up on this stuff. Yeah. So many people aren't trained in it, but come into the job with this natural charisma and ability to build rapport. So we're having to work twice as hard. And what you're finding is that some managers that, that have got that great relationship with their people and are having these conversations and, and, and it's, it's not, getting the same results so we kind of need to just shift that a little bit and look at right what's really important to us and you know if anybody's um listening today that's heard me talk before and wendy i bored you with it the other day i always come back to our natural brain chemistry i always come back to our happy chemicals and how we as business owners and leaders and managers can influence how the people around us are and how happy they're feeling so if you look at something like dopamine it's so present in our industry you know dopamine is what gets released when we're, we're anticipating reward but think about our commissions think about our incentives you know look at yourselves and your businesses and how you're managing your people do you really understand their motivators drivers and values and do they align with what the company is doing now you know are they rewarded based on their individual drivers motivators and values and are you getting the best out of them because you know how to tap into them or are you using quite a dated reward framework that is just there and it's great and you think it's brilliant because it gives people x amount of money or this watch this bag um we can't now do the lunch clubs i've definitely <laughs> seen that that's a problem right now yeah. so you know how can you really get your managers to work with these individuals to get the very best out of them to increase their dopamine levels and typically if i was working with somebody on creating new strategies i'd be getting them to almost chunk down their expectations so let's let's look at this and i don't mean micromanagement i mean look at how high is the bar in terms of what you expect from your people and when you're in front of them and you're able to engage the room and you're able to sort of get people going maybe we can't do that so much at the moment with the guys that are at home or maybe our people aren't as engaged in the, in the actual physical space because of what's been happening. So let's just realign that somewhat. And then you look at um, something that, I, you know, the one that's very, I think, very crucially important to business owners is, is oxytocin, right? So if you're a parent, you typically know that when you have a child, especially if you're breastfeeding or you've got skin to skin contact, you feel oxytocin release. It's that bond. It's that trust. 
and, and people often say to me, well, how is that relevant in recruitment? And I'm like, it's so relevant because, you know, you will get the best from people when they trust you and they feel they're in a safe environment, when they're bonded with you, when you're all working towards the common goal. So if that transparency and that communication isn't prevalent in your organization, again, that that those oxytocin chemicals aren't going to be pushed to the fore so some of the advice i was given to companies five or six months ago was how are you communicating about covid about furlough scheme about what's happening about what what, what is ha what is going on with the people on furlough what is going on for the people to you know that, that are in the business mm -hmm. and and tying it back to, to that a few times the, the only other big one that i think i talked to you about wendy was our serotonin levels the, the one that's, you know, most commonly known, which is tied to our feelings, our mood, um, you know, not feelings of importance, but when people acknowledge how well, you've done well, look at what we do in the industry. We yell a top biller, you know, this person's done the best this week, this month. You know, when you consider your your management framework, you know, are you just going through the motions or are you really looking at ways in which to acknowledge with individuals the good stuff that they're doing? And then how does that tie into your performance management framework? So it's such a big topic. I think that, that <laughs> it is, but it's it's really interesting that you've touched on that because um I'm a bit geeky on this stuff as well. And, you know, if you go back to the simplest sort of Maslow's hierarchical of needs yeah. and really what happened there, if you think about it, we were all we were all going really well. So we were all sort of, you know, up there in the top pyramids there on the top of that triangle. And suddenly, boom, you know, we all had to flatten out to those safety needs. And that's when you mentioned that word safety. Yeah. Everybody needed to really understand with that communication that you're OK. Yeah. And, you know, the company is going to take you through that. Um, <laughs> and then it's really how you start building those businesses back up to allow people to come you know, to come back from just sort of wanting to make sure that they've got the house, they're here, you know, they've got internet, because that was one of the biggest things is actually, you know, that is one of your basic needs now is just a new hierarchy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just to be able to communicate. I have to say, first four weeks of lockdown, I was running a business on a mobile phone because BT yeah. had, that couldn't come around and dig up. The, and it was very, very stressful. Stressful, absolutely. <laughs> you know? And, you know, I, I've just seen in the comments there, if I can pick up on that, you know, yeah. uh, you know somebody's written, surely it would be more important for remote workers to self-report their mood when previously there would have been physical signals to ask for help. You know what? That's such an important comment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the work that we're doing in mental health and recruitment and some of the feedback and, and what I'm seeing from the survey results, people don't feel that there is an environment of safety in order mm -hmm. to do that. People don't feel that they can say, I'm not coping, I'm stressed, I'm not, man unless an organization, and there are some brilliant recruitment companies out there that do have a robust framework that does support, it's a case of recruiters or, or the, the staff, for want of a better expression, are scared. Mm. And what I'm gonna do is share out, um, when we go, as we're compiling the results from the survey, there's a few free box texts where we've asked people, you know, what are the biggest, they think, reasons for mental health issues in the workplace and also what could their employer do? And some of those things that are coming in, I think I, I want to get them out. I want to share those comments because, you know, it's I'm hearing things like, well, our organisation outwardly ticks a big box when it comes to mental health and well-being, but we don't do very much internally. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff there. And I think. You know, if you are going to get somebody to self-report their mood, it has they have to be reporting to the right person. That's, it, that's key. You have to know how to respond to somebody that says that to you. And so many of us as, a, as recruitment businesses don't have those people in the right positions in order to do that. And a huge topic, which isn't for today, that, that we're covering at the moment, is the people that are in the position of mental health first aider. They are typically very empathetic caring individuals that doesn't necessarily make them the right person to be the first signpost in an organization because it's a lot to take on if you don't know how to set those boundaries there's a there's a huge learning piece which is what mental health and recruitment is all about really you know let's there's a lack of understanding so let's be more clear about what it means in the industry it doesn't necessarily mean a specific disorder like bipolar or borderline personality disorder it's the fact that you know we are a people industry we employ people and our product is people. We have to know how to treat people. Uh, you know, our culture and that well-being piece is, is so important. And the discretionary effort that people give us when they're happy, again, accounts for billions in the UK economy. It's, it's lost because they're not managed in the right way. Well, I mean, let's be frank, though, you know, most of the recruitment agencies, well, the, the highest percentage of recruitment agencies in the UK, you know, they're going to be 10 to 20 employees. Now, 
you know, having the luxury of having somebody trained mm. in HR, let alone, yeah. you know, me- mental health and well-being to w- align it with culture and progress results, because that's what a recruitment agency is trying to do. You know, it is a minefield. Um, and that's that's going to be very difficult to get that balance. So, you know, are you you now sort of almost advocating that we should hire a second person that is not, you know, it's, it used to be the health and safety officer to make sure that the fire alarm went on. Now it's the now it's the mental well, you know, men, mental well-being person that looks that is able to have those educated conversations. I mean, how how does a recruitment leader de- deal with all of this? That's such a good question, and it's interesting, isn't it, that by law we have to have that health and safety person with regards to physical health. Um, the health and safety executive only recommend at the moment that you have a mental health first aider. But my view on that has been the same, and I see that evolving to become legislative based on probably COVID's going to be, play a big part of it. And if anyone's followed the um, UCL reports, they've been doing like this, this ongoing track around well-being because of COVID. You know, that might be one of the things that comes out of this. So it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant question, Wendy. And, you know, interestingly, I think there's, there's a few different pieces. There is a gap in our industry that answers that question, which is what we're aiming to do with mental health and recruitment. One of the things we launch with Um, uh, we said was forthcoming was the awareness to action pledge and the idea of the awareness to action pledge was to you know take away just from the awareness let's talk Mm -hmm. about mental health on mental health awareness day or world suicide prevention day and let's move this to tangible action but in recruitment we do like to we like things simple we like things to happen quite quickly and you know some companies may be very familiar with the time to change um, employer pledge, which has now been retired. And that's brilliant. And a lot of their findings and their recommendations were based on the um, Farmer and Stevenson thriving at work report. And the idea with our awareness to action is that it is almost tailored for the recruitment industry to help recruitment business owners have a very basic roadmap of things that may need to happen. And, you know, I... <laughs> I can't say, oh, yes, you you know, I think you should have a mental health person in every single business. But I'm saying that there are some things you can do that don't cost money that make a huge difference. And let's not with, you know, look at that notwithstanding, I guess, um, those size businesses, are they typically run by individuals that did very well, that came from a meritocratic environment that were top billers, you know, my looking at what I've been doing in the last probably seven years. So I've been in the industry 23 years. I've been focused very much more on this space in the last seven years. And um, more and more of those business owners are now keen to learn a little bit more about leadership. But they did. They started up a business because they were really good at what they did. They weren't necessarily the best biller. You know, we confuse our high potentials with our high performance in recruitment. So there's yeah, again. Yeah. Shouldn't, shouldn't no, no, it's, it's, it, no, 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 Paul, because it, I, I, it, 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 this is what leaders are thinking right now. It's like, whoa, hey, I've got to get results. I've got to get all these bills paid. Gosh, now I've got to, you know, look after everybody coming back. You know, how on earth do I juggle it all? And that is exactly why we're having the show today to try and tackle some of these things. Now, I've got a great comment here as well. Um, just looking at it in terms of, you know, how technology can actually play a role. Yep. Um, and using some technology skills um, or technology in your business to make them feel as though they're actually still part of a team because it can be very isolating, but technology can enable people to come together. So I think that's, that, you know, I I, I recognise that. Um, is, is, is there any sort of, um, I, I almost also aware of, um, you know, within um, the 365, there is, you know, the my activities. So you can see who you're collaborating with, how many time, you know, how much time you've been collaborating with people. You know, that could be something that's very easy as a tool to bring into, you know, your one to one conversations, who you're talking to, who you're not talking to, how much of your time is actually spent isolated, how much is collaborating. I think that would be a really good. Have you picked up on anything else that you've seen along the way that's, that the companies are doing well? So a few years ago, I worked with a business that had um, this amazing mobile enablement tool called Sococo. And it was almost this gamified um, platform whereby you could have people log on and you would see it was like a blueprint of an office. And there were little emojis and you'd literally replicate having different office rooms and the sales floor and everything else. And there's a few products like that that are out there and they're absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I would always say any mobile en- enablement tool that you're using, especially for people at home, need to come for a caveat because they can become just as isolating and I'm talking mm. to somebody that was working very much in this business that would get up in the morning get my kids up ready to sort themselves out for school jump in here log on be present morning everyone morning everyone yes I'd go off and do the school run but then I'd come back and then you know some days I would not leave this space for hours and it became mm-hmm. more of a chain so you know I think what what the, the, the 
coaching and the piece that I've done around remote working in the last six months has been there is almost a different culture to remote working and you need to understand how that fits together. You know, you cannot stay online in a meeting like this. If you imagine you and I jumping on at nine o'clock in the morning, Wendy, and we said, right, we're going to go from nine till one. We're going to have a little break. Yeah, grab mm-hmm. some food, eat our desk. Sounds like my board meeting this morning. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. And, you know, we have to take more enforced breaks. Because mm-hmm. the, again, going back to the Zoom fatigue or remote work acuity, it plays, it, it takes its toll. So I think there's a huge amount of um, software out there. I, I've just seen that Lee McQueen's, um, he's launched one called um, Phoenix Eye, I think. Right. And obviously the North Star product, um, this, that's some great stuff you've got. We can use mobile enablement to definitely support what we're doing. Yeah. But we are human beings at the end mm-hmm. of the day. And um, I think that's one of the biggest struggles that that we like and we need contact. Mm-hmm. That's just who we are. So, um, yes, but absolutely use what you can, but almost use it responsibly. Don't don't think that it's going to solve problems and that you don't. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you said that use responsibly. I think if I gave my team <laughs> something with emojis or um, GIFs, then I would hate to see what they would do that with it more than they do already. So, <laughs> I know it's good. Cool. Well, I'm just going to use the last um, couple of minutes that, that we want to sort of bring it back down. And, and I really want to get some tangibles here in terms of like the steps, because what, what we're talking, we've acknowledged that there is changes in the market. We've got to sort of take this a little bit more from awareness. I think awareness is started to happen and we've got to put it into practical steps now and really the way I come in at it is that anything you do with your talent and your your people you know is 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 essentially embracing your culture and it's developing your culture so how do we get your culture to also steps there that would align this to your business goals because we all need results and um, that's our industry so just to sort of summarize to take away from our audience you know what what could they sort of start to be thinking about right now to put into play um, after your show? Okay, so, um, right, I like this. Quick fire, quick fire. Yeah. Um, is the vision that you have for the business fully communicated and transparent to the people? So do you have your employer value proposition and your employee value proposition? I.e., mm-hmm. are you communicating to your people that this is what we're going to do for you and in return, this is what we need you to do to us? If you're Brilliant. not doing that, start there it's the most it's the simplest place get your you know your evp it doesn't have to be complicated in place and then start looking at the gaps you need to be communicating with your people you need to be finding out what the feel is surveying them and do it in a way where you know you're not going to give them a kick if they don't say what you need them to say because if you want to get them you know if if, if you're a business if, if you're a football coach and you need the team to start performing at this level you kind of need to understand uh, let's let's keep the football analogy what their physical health is yeah, yeah. What's preventing these footballers from playing in this league? That's a rubbish analogy. No, I like it. I'm all for analogies and sports does well. So that's good. And yeah, let's go with that. So I think that's that's the big thing. You need to understand and you need to get it. You also need to get mental health isn't a scary word, right? We all have it. We all have health. It's the same thing. Physical, mental, doesn't matter. Um, some of us are just much better at managing our our mental health and our you know those negative thoughts feelings and flexibility so more than happy to answer any questions offline or in the future that's brilliant Rhonda and that's I, I, I absolutely love that because it's a responsibility for the leaders if change has happened this is where I want you to go I'm setting the context of the direction but for the managers and the leaders out there you know what is your responsibility to communicate your expectations to allow them to get there and that is the alignment that will happen um you know we're very good at communicating our employer brand to our yeah. customers but let's look at that um, employee responsibility and brand you know within as well so it's a really good way of sort of summing up i think from today and and as, as i think we said um when we were planning this call we we could we could chat and chat, um, which, which is which is really really good. But I think we're going to get. Um, I think that's Katie just fired up the the LinkedIn um, link to you. Obviously, got that survey. It's on your LinkedIn as well. Please let's get as many recruiters to fill this in, so we can really understand what we need to do, so we can move this from awareness to practical sense, or practical steps, because that's what we all like in recruitment. Yeah, it's, it's knowing how we can move yeah. this forward and get it done. <laughs> Rhonda. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Everyone else, thank you for um, joining us. We're going to be tackling the next um, topic, um, which is also around uh, around the same um, sort of 
um, sort of theme in terms of working from anywhere, working remotely, you know, the, the changes in the business, because we've got to now think about e-learning. So, you know, taking this to the next step, how are we actually going to be doing onboarding? How are we going to make sure our recruiters can actually learn from one another? Because let's face it, we are in an industry that you sit somebody beside a top biller and that's how they learn or they sink or swim. You know, well, that can't happen now because we're all not sitting beside one another for the majority of, of companies. So I want, I've got Alan Hiddleston that's going to be our next guest and he's going to be talking uh, to us about e-learning and what's happened in that marketplace. So I'm really looking forward to that in the next couple of weeks. Um, so please join us. Again, if you like what we do, you um, keep showing up, show, you know, get your mates to follow as well. Um, and any topics that you'd like us to do or any guests that you'd like us to bring in, um, please drop me a link on my LinkedIn or messages. I'd be delighted to hear. Rhonda, thank you so much. Good luck with your survey. And I look forward to seeing the results. Thanks, Wendy.